Welcome to the Modern Husbands Podcast, where any combination of Dr. Ross, Christian, and Brian host national experts who share winning ideas to manage money and the home as a team. Join your fellow Modern Husbands and have links to our podcasts, articles, and other resources to manage money and the home as a team sent to your inbox every couple of weeks by subscribing to our newsletter at modernhusbands.com. For today, Julia Carpenter of the Wall Street Journal will share some of the money wisdom she has gained in her career journey, including her current personal finance reporting with the Wall Street Journal. Enjoy today's show. Julia, uh, again, we're, we're so thrilled and honored that, that you made it today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Well, we're really interested in just where your passion came from, whether it's um, like an allowance or was it something you bought, something you've saved for. But what is your first memory of money? I love that you asked that question. Um, I distinctly remember saving up to buy uh, Pegasus. It was right when the movie Hercules came out and there was a Pegasus you could buy for your Barbies. Like actually now that the Barbie movie is out, this is very Hercules. Movie? Yes. 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 <laughs> and I remember, so I guess that was like 1997 or something. I was like five or six. And my parents said, if you really want this for your Barbies, cause I was all in on Barbie, you can save up and have it. And I tried to pool money for my sisters too. But I, I remember, so I guess I was six. So I knew a little bit about money, but I remember taking all of our coins and lining them up in a row. And I still remember this. The Pegasus cost $37 and I lined up 37 coins. And I said to my sisters, okay, we got it. We got it. Mm. We're, we're there. We're there. And my mom walked in and she was like, oh no, now let me tell you that that is not how this works. These are all different coins. It was like whatever, like two nickels my sister had. And then my like, four, I was like, we're there guys. Like we're, we're slowly, we can count. We got it. We got it. <laughs> um, and my parents were always very open about talking about money with us. They were very, I'm one of five kids. So if we wanted something special, we had to save for it. We had to buy it for ourselves. We had to feel. I distinctly remember buying, and now I sound like I'm a Barbie hoarder, but I remember buying another Barbie that I had saved my money for. And as my Nana was opening the box, feeling, oh, this isn't really, I, I distinctly remember feeling this wasn't worth the money. I was maybe in like second or second grade, maybe first grade. And I thought this isn't worth the money. I can feel like p spending and saving all of that. And then opening this Barbie, it doesn't look like how I imagined it to, or like seeing it out of the box doesn't feel as good as thinking about it. Um, and I still feel that. I feel like all of these things you feel when you first think about money are still like universal emotions, you know, like scraping Absolutely. for something realizing it's not worth it, the like, you know, buyer's remorse that I had when I was in second grade, I still feel now just like not maybe opening like a shoe box and not a Barbie box. Is it is it coming up more now with the Barbie movie being out? I know maybe that's where this is coming from. I'm realizing as I'm talking, but I also think that I was a child of like actually like very simple wants. Like I loved playing pretend. Like everything that I played was always like we had a giant dress up box that was just filled with like old dance costumes or things that people in the neighborhood would give us. So if I was buying something, it was something like a Barbie that my parents thought like, we're mm -hmm. not spending money on a Barbie, which by the way, I don't know if you all have bought a Barbie recently, but I, last year, my friend was throwing a doll themed birthday and she wanted to have Barbies just scattered around. And I said, okay, great. Let's go to the store and buy a bunch. And we went and I was looking at them and I said, everything, <laughs> that's my friend's name. These are like, I remember Barbies being like, $15. These are like $25 or $30. So I can totally, I really, in that moment, related to my parents so much. I was like, I'm not buying you a piece of plastic for $25 that you're going to open and not even like when it's out of the box. A quick word from one of our sponsors, Money Marriage You. Listeners have told us that they love the ideas we share in our podcast to manage money as a team and want to learn more. That is why we created Money Marriage You, Self-paced online courses for couples designed by national financial therapy and financial planning experts. You can find our Money Marriage You courses on our website at modernhusbands.com. 
While visiting ModernHusbands.com, be sure to join fellow Modern Husbands as bi-monthly newsletter subscribers and receive great ideas to manage money in the home as a team and a few free gifts. Now back to the show. You're the perfect target for both the influencer movement and the de-influencer movement uh, of sort of coupling back our spending on things that we don't need, but also, yeah, you know, let's have a little fun with this prep for our, our big Barbie, you know, pretend session. <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh yeah. It's so interesting to see that arc, isn't it? I've thought about it so much. I've been very curious to see how quickly the de-influencers are also being de-influenced. You know, some of the things that they do purchase or they do laud, people, of course, are now like taking maybe a closer eye to. And the way that the influencer who, you know, has 30 different like tap to buy things, we don't examine as closely because it seems like mm -hmm. if you're, if you have scruples about one thing, it must mean that you have scruples about all things, which I find really interesting. Yeah. Mm. It's that I've never really been like an Instagram shopper, but I really sympathize with it because it's so easy to do. It's so right. easy to do. They make it so beautiful. What a beautiful experience. You know, you don't even have plays to plays on close. that fantasy. Absolutely. It creates the fantasy. It cre yeah. you don't even have to have it. And immediately I'm like, ooh, I want wine glasses that are shaped like roses with stems that are definitely gonna break the first time <laughs> I try to wash them. And then I think, well, when am I actually going to use these? <laughs> or I'm going to use them once. Yeah. And, have, have it, you but all, it's not going to be expectations. I totally, have you all heard of girl math? Have you seen this, this trend? No. I think no. I'm probably going to write about it. So I'll have to send you a, a, a link when I do it. There's a TikTok trend called girl math where it's, it's sort of a joke, but also there is a seed of truth in it where you are justifying a purchase by doing what they call girl math. So you look at something, say like these wine glasses and you're like, okay, these wine glasses are $30 for wine glasses with the little curly stems and leaves and they're shaped like roses. But when was the last time I bought wine glasses? How much do other wine glasses cost? How often do I drink wine? How many times do I have people over? If we do the math, maybe $30 is only, if I use them 10 times in the next month, that's only $3 for every time I have someone over and you're doing this. And some people of course are playing it, you know, like very as a comedic bit, but some people are doing it seriously and I actually find it, you know, I, I know we're all, the way it comes out is like, we're joking and saying like, this isn't real math. Sometimes it really is real math. I saw a girl in the comments saying, I bought a purse and I found out it was only 27 pence aware. And I was like, that's actually interesting. Like, is that good for her? You know, like maybe all her other purses are 40 pence aware when she does that math. So this is better to do this. I think it's really, it's, it's an something interesting about, rate. yeah, I love what you were saying, Bruce, about like thinking about it by time. Like that's the other, by where, that's like what yeah. makes it interesting. If you buy something and you're like, okay, I think about this all the time with weddings now because all my friends are getting married. I'm like, okay, if I buy this dress to wear to a wedding and I only wear it to one wedding, okay, why did I do that? But if I buy a dress that I can wear to a bunch of different things and I'm also going to wear it to a wedding, okay, great. If I'm going to wear it to multiple weddings, even better. If I'm going to wear it to multiple weddings and then also my sister's bachelorette party this weekend, incredible purchase. You know, I've gotten like as much use of out of it as I've expected. Um, there is like one dress I'm thinking of that I did <laughs> do this with. But it's like actually like an interesting way to think about something instead of what we so often do. And I think we're all guilty of this is you don't really think about how it fits into your daily life. You're either filling a hole, oh, I need wine glasses, or oh, I need a dress for a wedding, that you haven't even interrogated. Like, why do I need a new dress for this wedding? What's wrong with my old wine glasses? And then yeah. stuck with that. I, I remember um, a Stanford University professor talking about the fact that um, we are so great at rationalizing the irrational. So I have to wonder if maybe it's a little bit of that, because the like your wine story makes total sense. And then if you think like, well, wait, what if you just use styrofoam cups, you know, then, you know, you've just saved $186 or, or whatever it may well, be. What if you don't drink wine? You know, or like, you, what if it's like, you've yeah. made all of these justifications and you're like, but I actually don't drink wine and neither do any of my friends really, <laughs> Right. you know? Yeah. It's, uh, there has to be probably another layer of rationalization there as you're actually thinking through, but I'm all for people actually thinking through the purchase. I agree. And making sure it's legitimate. 
or doing math period, you know, like just doing math period. Like, okay, I know that I have this much in my bank account, so I can't afford this, but like, what is the worth of that amount of money to me (laughs) relative to what I already spent on glassware relative to what I would need to do. Like I'm, I'm all about just like, even, even if you're using it to justify something, I'm all about like keeping the math top of mind period, because I think right. that it's really easy not to, it's really easy yeah. not to, it feels really good not to. So, so Julia, you're an awesome writer for the wall street journal have done, done a lot on money decisions. Can you, Tell us a little bit about your journey from college, which was at UGA, where uh, I got my doctorate. So go dogs. Go dogs. Um, <laughs> you know, from, but your journey from UGA to the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Um, thank you for the compliment, by the way. When I was in college, I worked for the student newspaper. It's the Red and Black. And I... Yeah did every single job at the newspaper. I mean, pretty much every single job. I designed pages. I wrote about sports. I was an investigative reporter. I was a news editor. I was editor in chief. I I did everything that I could do just trying to find out what I liked, but also sort of where most of my story ideas were leading me. And by the time I graduated from school, I was, it was sort of, I graduated from school in 2013 and it was sort of the heyday of social media taking over our brains and influencing our decisions. So I was really gravitating to a lot of stories about tech, a lot of stories about social media, a lot of stories about when that line from like online to IRL gets blurry for people, when that is complicating our online lives or our in-person lives. Um, And when I graduated, I had interned at, again, kind of done something similar. I had interned at a ton of places, but interned at a lot of different kinds of media, you know, working at like broadcast media as well as digital media, as well as magazines, as well as newspapers. And I just knew that everything was sort of collapsing in on itself with that. I was like, okay, I can do any kind of story as long as it's a good story. And my first job out of college was at the Washington Post. And I worked on the audience team. I was a contractor. And that was back when the audience team was only like, I think five people. And now it is Mm -hmm. like, I, can't, I couldn't even tell you how many people work on that audience team there and how many different teams have spun off of that. It just shows how much social media has changed journalism, but also how much journalism oh, yeah. has changed social media. And I always tell students this because they just, they crack up. But like one of my first jobs at the Washington Post was managing the Google Plus, you know, like it was, it just shows how quickly the times have changed. So I was, I was writing stories for Uh, a lot about online culture, but I was also doing things like managing our Snapchat presence, managing our Tumblr presence, like figuring out where the Washington Post was sort of fitting on these platforms. So nothing explicitly financial journalism, nothing explicitly business journalism, but I knew I really wanted to write more. I wanted to be a writer. I didn't want to be um, you know, an audience professional or a social media manager who was finding time for writing. I wanted to be a writer who was still passionate about these other things. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that I did that was I started writing a lot about the gender wage gap. We realized that we weren't, this was like right after lean in published, you know, right when people were starting to sort of keep these conversations in the social media mainstream that then was going to like carry over to our pages And with my colleague, Alex Laughlin, we started this, and again, sounds kind of vintage now, but at the time was like cutting edge. We started a Slack group for women to talk about how the gender wage gap is affecting their lives. So I started writing all these stories inspired by that group. People would tell us things about how the promise of lean in had failed them, or people would tell us things about how spending money to appear professional in a workplace, it actually really related to the cost per wear conversation that we were just having is like something that they feel is unfair, that their male colleagues don't have to do the same thing to be treated seriously. So I started writing all these stories related to this and realizing like, this is such a perfect beat for me. Like I can write about culture. I can write about gender. I can write about tech. I can write about all of these things encapsulated in how money is affecting people's Mm. lives. And so Mm. from there, there was an incredible editor. I owe him like such a huge thank you um, for what he did for my career. There's an editor who he's now at the New York Times. He leads their sole uh, business bureau. His name's Rich Barbieri. 
he was at CNN Business, then editor in chief of CNN Business. And he reached out to me and literally made a job description that said, you are going to be on our personal finance team and you are going to be writing about gender and money. And then over time, as I kept working there, it became more about workplace issues, workplace culture as it relates to money, diversity in the workplace, all of these different things. Just so by the time... Yeah. Oh, yeah, all, exactly. Like very, related. very, very related. I think the way that that... I actually ended up sort of like doing all of those different things was just that I realized as I was writing about the gender wage gap that you also then can't write about the other wage gaps that exist or you can't not, or sorry, you can't not write about the other wage gaps that exist. Like as soon as you start looking at that data, there's so much there and it's so intractable that it's, it's, there's so much to talk about. Um, And this was also, by the way, when I took this job, Me Too happened within months. So it was just like an explosion Mm. of us talking about how these things have ripple effects in workplaces, how these things have ripple effects in women's careers, um, women's earnings, women's lives, all these different things to talk about. So from there, I ended up with the Wall Street Journal as a truncation. I I have a quick question. When you were looking into the gender pay gap, is there a certain point, a a point like where um, it could be after they were married or after they had a child, whenever it may be, just like a transition point in their lives where you saw the gender pay gap either increase or begin to become Noticeable. a parent. Yeah. yeah. The the thing, this is so interesting because I struggle with this because I, I I feel like it's worthy to do like a story or a deep dive on, honestly. And it's it's like always at the top of my list. Because the thing that's really difficult about looking at all of this data is that especially right now, and I'm, I'm telling you you all things you already know, women are really catching up to men in earnings, especially younger women. And oftentimes right. they're even mm-hmm. exceeding men. Yep. I, think, I think that's the latest data from Pew is that millennial women are actually like out earning men. Yeah. But the pay gap is so intractable because so many women are still in fields that are the women dominated fields are still paying them less in lifetime earnings. Mm. So women mm. who work in tech, for example, will say to me, and I talk to them all the time and they say, I make more than my male colleagues. You know, people tell me the gender wage gap is holding me back. Like I'm thriving. And I'm like, right. But if you look at how many women are in teaching, for example, my younger sister is a teacher and you know, the, she's, she teaches in rural Georgia and her salary is far lower than that of a woman working it at Google. I mean, it's obvious, but these fields that are so dominated by women, we just historically mm-hmm. pay that work less. And once women drop out of the workforce, which is happening less, but still historically happens once you start doing that math again about, okay, we have kids at home, childcare is expensive. One of us right. has to, one of us has to make a move here. Oftentimes it's these women who are in fields that either are paying them less or perhaps they were in fields that aren't paying them less, but they're making less than their partner for whatever mm-hmm. reason. One of us is going to step back, save the money on childcare, or we're going to move to part-time, move to another kind of work, et cetera. And then over time, their lifetime earnings are then depressed. So yep. it's not as simple as, okay, look at these two people. They One's a man, one's a woman. Oh my God, she's making 87 cents less. It's this like very complicated, very, I keep using this word, but like, very intractable thing that is affecting those lifetime earnings. And I, I always feel like it's worth to do something that's even like what we what we get wrong about the gender pay gap or what we can't unravel in the gender pay gap because so much of younger younger women when I talk to them are not they don't get it. They are saying like I just don't see this. I don't see this in my lives. I don't see this in the lives of my friends. I don't see this in how, you know, there's been so many uh, ways that I can now, of course, in New York state, you know, salaries are so transparent now by law. You know, I I have all the access to this. Like, this isn't going to be a problem for me. And I'm like, it's maybe not going to be a problem for you depending on the field you're in and depending on what's going to happen once you have kids. But it's, yeah, it's very... And I think that's where those traditional roles for a lot of families come into play for society as whole. Because, yeah, you're right. Like, we see it lessening, like, statistically. And even women, younger women or millennial women are earning more up until, like, the age of 30. Totally. Totally. And then we're seeing that shift. Um, But I think it's also, um, 
I know uh, Megan. Yeah, McCoy, I'd be so curious to hear what you have to say, Bruce, because yeah, well, you you uh, spe- yeah. Uh, Dr. Megan McCoy, you, we've had on this podcast uh, from K State, uh, or that we worked with uh, before. Um, her and I were discussing this as well, in that um, there's also this trend that even when women are reporting that they're earning the same or more, it's not consistent. So it's totally. only like one out of five years. Totally. Or if you, but if you look at it across like a five-year spectrum, it, it's not consistent over those five years. Um, so it, it's just a snapshot of maybe that period in their time um, or in their career, but it's not consistent over the, the long haul. And it's um, so understandable. I mean, when you talk to people about how expensive childcare is, how do you afford that? I mean, it's so understandable. Like dropping right. out of the workforce in many cases is not what these women want to do or is their top choice, but they're like, this This is the only thing that works. Like there's yeah. no other path out of here. I mean, it, childcare costs vary so much depending on where you live, but they're it, uniformly everyone says they're expensive. You know, yeah, nobody no, says uh... this is affordable. So I pre pandemic, like back in 2020, I think it was like $997 on average yeah. a month for like daycare services Yeah, per child. Per, um, per month, per week, per, per, yeah, per month, per month. Okay. So like you need an extra thousand dollars totally. per child and sometimes you get discounts, but, and that's only gone up with all the demands that COVID has brought and parents now would be get this kid out of my house. <laughs> um, get out of my home office. Work. Yeah, we're going yeah. back to yeah, the work themselves. Like, so I, th- I think those numbers have only gone up. Yeah, yeah. There's one last wrinkle here too that I, I know, Brian, you've cited in several of your articles um, with uh, Market Watch, et cetera, where uh, let's say in a, you know, a male-female partnership, right? the uh, woman is out earning the man and working longer hours, still in that setup, uh, the female partner is still doing more home labor, you know, totally. child care, totally. dishes and laundry and, and all the rest, you know, such that it's not an equitable distribution of the home Absolutely. labor either. And it just goes to show that, you know, we, guys like we have a very uh important if if not sensitive role to play in uh closing the pay gap in the workplace as well as uh you know the elements of home life that perpetuate the the um wage gap so absolutely that's why i love uh you know that you're joining us here today julia and that we uh, hopefully can, you know, move the ball forward together uh, on, on these Absolutely. interwoven challenging, you know, challenging issues. Um, can you tell us about the new rules of money? Uh, oh, thank you for asking. Yes. How the new about. rules of money. Yeah. The new rules of money is a book I've co-written with my former editor, Bray Lam. It is publishing, uh, Bray Lam, I should say. Um, it is publishing December 5th from Clarkson Potter. And it's what we're hoping is an interactive workbook that can help people feel more confident in how they manage their money, but also think about their money. Uh, Inspired by a newsletter challenge she and I wrote together in 2020, fall of 2020, that is still alive. People can sign up for it now. It's called the Six Week Money Challenge. It is still attracting subscribers, still soliciting lots of feedback for us. We're super grateful for everyone who's participated in it, but seeing the success of that newsletter, which we had envisioned as, you know, easy money challenges for hard times, like ways to sort of level up your game. We realized like there's so much to do here. I had written a story in I think 2019, maybe 2019 or 2020 about, you know, your parents' financial advice is kind of wrong about how when I try to get my parents' financial advice on things, they're very well-intentioned. The principles are definitely there, but we're just talking about different numbers and different yeah. times. You know, By the time my parents were my age, I'm 32. 
that talk about doing math. I was like, I'm 32. Um, they had, they had me, they had a house, they had, they had, it was, it was just different. Our lives are it's different. Totally it's different circumstances. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, they, they, different, lo- different laws, different policies, different Absolutely. economic situation. Everything was just, totally. I just totally. had this conversation. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. But I, I, people, it's something people love to talk about because it's, I feel like it's universal. It's just relatable. So we wanted to take the lessons I sort of learned from that article and the lessons we learned from this newsletter challenge, but we really wanted to create something that felt fun and inviting. Um, the number one thing I feel, and I'm so curious to hear what you all think too. And so we're, we're so many personal finance, you know, projects and, you know, very well-intentioned courses, all these other things fail is that they're just really, really intimidating. And someone wants you to literally say, okay, sit down here, open up your bank account. Like it has to be so low level, so easy, but not condescending. And it's a really hard line because there's these huge blocks that we have, these huge, like sort of mental and psychological hurdles to doing this stuff. But I also really hate when I read a whole article about how to save for a down payment and it's, you know, the gist is save more. I'm like, okay, well, I'm trying to do that. You know, I'm already doing these things. I feel like I've got it. So the book is very, uh, very much like a notebook. We call it a workbook. You know, we have pages that walk you through these challenges. We have pages that sort of want prompt you to think about the goals that you have for yourself, how you can imagine these things, put them on a roadmap, plan for them, um, as well as it's very instructive. So I'm hoping that people can sort of find their way to it the way that we, the way Bray and I always talk about this is it's, we want it to be like a cookbook. You know, we want it to find, find people the way that a cookbook finds someone, which is that everybody can read Dessert Person by Claire Saffitz, which is one of my favorites, but like some of us are going to do the croquembouche that takes 30 hours and requires you to know how to do shoe pastry. And some of us are going to do like the easy lemon curd tart that you do in a week. And we're going to feel different senses of accomplishment from that, but we still feel each of us with our experiences feels like the book is for us, you know, and that the book is speaking to us. So I'm excited to see what everybody thinks about it. We have an amazing illustrator who, her name's Jess Coronan. She is a star and there, it's going to be really fun. Awesome. Which is where all, all three of us are from, you know, financial education backgrounds. And there's this notion in education and financial education of um, low floor, high ceiling. So you want uh, the floor yeah. to be low for, for yeah. students so they can access uh, the lesson right away. And then high ceiling so that, you know, every kid can strive for taking that next big step. And it sounds like the book uh, and the sort of notebook approach that you're taking has a similar philosophy. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I'm excited. I was just to- thinking as you were saying that, I was like, I need to... I lean and need to file that away. Talking with you all about this is the first I've talked about it in a like, oh, holy shit, it's coming soon capacity. So as I was talking about it, I was like, <laughs> I need to think about how I want to talk about this. It's December is coming up. It's not hypothetical anymore. Low floor, high ceiling. The other thing that's so great about that is that you leave feeling good. You know, like I don't, I, I talk to people so often where they just they, they sit down for one meeting with a financial planner or, you know, again, to talk about parents, you know, they talk to their dad one time about like, hey, dad, how do I do this? And you leave feeling bad. You leave feeling like, God, I don't know anything. God, I did that wrong. Or like, God, they don't know what they're talking about. Like, I don't know. And, and you just leave feeling confused. And when you leave feeling confused and bad, what you do is you just push it away. You know, you think, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to think about this. I'm not good at this. I mean, that's something I hear from so many women when it comes to personal finances, just like, well, I'm not good at this. And I'm like, what did you do? Who told you this? And then without a doubt, it's like, no, we haven't found the thing that speaks to you in the right way. Or like, oh no, we haven't found the thing that wasn't like, you know, using a diet metaphor to talk about saving. No wonder you were repulsed by that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I think when you go back to the research too, like women often underestimate their abilities and men overestimate their abilities. So then you have the, like, you know, in a heterosexual couple, you have the man saying, oh, I'll handle this. I got this. And they have no idea what they're doing either. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And and that, you know, that in and of itself is also a bad feeling. It sucks to feel like you know what you're doing. I have so much sympathy for that. Like, it sucks to feel like you know what you're doing 
and you've got all the tools and you're great at this and then you look and you overdrafted, that sucks. That's a bad <laughs> feeling too. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I find it frustrating whenever I see like interviews or I see, you know, it could be memes on social media about um, people from generations ago that you know, proclaimed that they had it all figured out, that they knew how to save and it was easy not to overspend. And, you know, I, I find myself kind of questioning whether or not they mm. fully understand the fact that, you know, before the internet, you know, they didn't have all of these different consumer opportunities like flying at them from all different angles and they didn't have the ease of spending at their fingertips, right? I mean, think about yeah. just being in the 1980s. If you wanted to go buy something, you know, you, in many cases, you had to go to the bank, you had to pull money out, then you had to go to the grocery store. So you had to drive there yeah. and, you know, you didn't have, you know, like the Walmarts of the world. So you had to go to five different places to buy um, all of the things that you needed to buy that day. So that in itself was a frustration. So you didn't want to go through that. So there was nothing convenient yeah. whatsoever about spending money in 1983. And now everything- <laughs> You would have had to really want tips. that Barbie. What's that? Unless you, you had, unless had to really want that Barbie. Want that Barbie. <laughs> like... <laughs> a lot of friction between you but... and that, yeah, you and that purchase for sure. <laughs> I also feel like, you know, the other thing, and this is something we try to address in the book too, is that there were, one of the things that social media has done is it's shown us a bunch of people who say that they've got it right. So then yeah. you feel like you've got it wrong. You know, when you're mm, looking, you when know. you're scrolling through yeah. Instagram and everyone has the keys to their new apartment that they bought and their life looks really good and it looks like they didn't have to compromise or sacrifice it's easy to feel bad about yourself and feel like you can't do that, you know, or that they've got some sort of secret that you haven't figured out and you have to find out what it is. And it, it, mm -hmm. it's just that they've sort of presented the highlight reel of how that right. process happened instead of, you know, this... saying, Hey, actually like I, my dad gave me $200,000 for my down payment. That's how this happened. And it's like, Oh, okay. Well that makes a lot more sense now. Julie, you remind me of this bumper sticker I saw, and this was before like all, all the extremes of Instagram and mm. stuff, and now, but it was uh, like, I want to live the life that my friends think I do on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, and I think we can apply it to Instagram or to, you know, any of the social media yeah. stuff now. I distinctly that, like, remember. It is, but it's, just the, it's the fantasy. Totally, Again, you know, like... totally. And we all participate in it. You know, I, I distinctly remember, I didn't mean to cut you off, Bruce. I'm sorry about that. But no, no, no. I distinctly remember I traveled a lot in 2018. I had a friend who got married in St. Lucia. My girlfriend and I went to Berlin. It was a trip that I've been thinking about a lot. We went to Montreal. We, it was a great year. I loved it. But that trip to St. Lucia was incredibly expensive. My friend was getting married on a resort. My girlfriend and I almost didn't go because it was so expensive, but we were like, she's she's basically my sister. Like we both are going. You know, the, the trip to Berlin, we actually really talked when we got back, like, was that a mistake? We also, we rode the world's cheapest, worst airline that still, if I think about it too hard, gives me a backache. Like, it's, we're lucky that we didn't lose our luggage or it? anything. Can you, can you say oh, what it is? Yes. It's called XL Airways. I do not recommend it. I is it worse? Not... Is it worse than like Frontier and Spirit Airlines? You know, I actually, I actually have not, my thing with Frontier and Spirit is that they'll just like cancel on you or drop you at a moment. But when you're on the plane, I'm like, okay, this is, this is fine. This is fine. Really? On XL Airways. I was, I think I was sitting hunched like this. I couldn't, and you know, you're flying to Berlin. So we just sat there like this the whole time in a freezing cold plane, feeling like we were just on a bus. But I, but I distinctly remember I had this year, I posted all about it and a guy I knew from college, I think, I think I probably went somewhere else in October or something. And he sent me a message and was like, oh my God, you're living the life of my dreams. How do you travel so much? I'm assuming it's all for work. What are you doing? And I thought, oh my God, yeah, I've made this look really easy. Like this actually, this is, I, this is not easy. Like he's looking at all my things, he's looking at all my posts and thinking, wow, oh my God, St. Lucia and then Berlin. Oh my God, Montreal, incredible. And I was like, no, like there's so much of it I didn't show. I'm complicit in this too. Day. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And you're right. It's not my everyday. We still look, we literally talked about it the other night. My girlfriend and I both were like, oh, 2018 was so fun. 2018 was so great. <laughs> and now I look back on it and I'm like, yeah, but like, remember how we spent, remember we, I remember at the resort, we ate something. I'm trying to remember. I think I ate something that was like fine, but I thought, oh, okay, well, at least it's free. It's in the resort or, you know, it's included in the resort fee. And then they brought us the check anyway. And the anger my girlfriend and I both felt, we were like, really, we're going to spend $30 right now on two of like, you know, the most mediocre hot dogs ever. And they were like, sorry, this is beach food. Isn't part of the resort fee or whatever. And we were like, oh my God, like we're idiots. Uh Dan, Dan Adderley from Duke um, wrote something about this, um, like he called it the pain of paying and how yeah. important it is just to divorce yourself from seeing that. And yeah. like, that's one of the advantages of an all-inclusive resort is you don't realize how much money that you're spending while while you're there drinking like sub-tier poor totally. alcoholic drinks. It was one of the reasons I actually, my girlfriend and I have talked about this since. I know a lot of, I have a friend actually, I just saw her the other day she and her husband are doing sort of a second honeymoon at one of these all-inclusive resorts. And for her, it is it is a financial relief actually to just like pay for it. Mm -hmm. And she's like, that way it's like yeah. one lump sum, I'm free. Right. With us, I just didn't, I didn't like it for that reason. I mean, there's a lot of other things obviously that people don't like about all-inclusive resorts, especially depending on where they are and like how they relate to the rest of the local economy. But for us, I was like, I have no control really over this you know like it feels yeah. also it's so much money you know like you, like you said yeah. it was so much money and we're at the swim up bar or whatever and I'm like I just wouldn't I wouldn't spend money on this right now like if I yeah. had my way this would be our you know our chill day that we're not at the swim up bar ordering my you feel compelled to like overeat and over drink totally oh totally yeah. you gotta get your value you, totally you gotta, you gotta, gotta maximize it you're exactly right. You're you're thinking yeah. everybody else I noticed at the wedding party was definitely on that train. We were all like, Oh my god, we're here. This is once in a lifetime, we gotta maximize it. Our friend's getting married. And then years later, of course, I'm looking back on it and I'm like, would not recommend necessarily. No, yeah. uh, there's nothing like low cost tequila and bad hot dogs to ruin a, to ruin <laughs> yeah. a trip. Bring you back down to earth when the hot dog has the beach food fee or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Are you engaged, recently married, or know someone who is? We are empowering engaged and recently married couples who want to manage money in the home as a team with a transition to marriage toolkit. Learn more at modernhusbands.com. Now back to the show. So um, in your money briefing, you've talked about relationships and money, partnerships and money. Uh, what are some things you've picked up along the way uh, from some of the episodes? Uh, that you wouldn't mind sharing with our listeners. Absolutely. Yeah. I started writing a lot about marriage, money, partnerships, money, couples, how we think about money, because I wrote a story about the gap between single people and married people, how wide that gap is. And a lot of people say like, okay, that is just math, right? Like two people make more than one person. But there's so there's there's some really interesting stuff happening there regarding how married people and how partnered people are able to just accelerate their wealth in a way that single people aren't able to. So one of the things that was really surprising to me is just how, you know, I think that this is something people have really strong feelings on and for whatever reason, their backgrounds or previous relationships. But the research out there shows that people who combine their finances are happier. They just, they, they like it more. They like being in the relationship more. They feel more accountable to each other. They feel like they're thinking about money more, which I really relate to as someone who shares money with my partner. Like she and I just talk about it more once we started sharing money. It was something that we both – also, I, I then realized I wasn't as likely to like, you know, just like spend money on something when she could see it. Even if I knew she wouldn't judge me, even if I knew she wouldn't care, I felt accountable to her and to the goals that we have together. It's mm. just the idea that somebody else is in it with you can do a lot in motivating you for that. Um, and she says mm. that she's felt the mm. same as well. Um, something that, so goals. I- do you, do you think that, that um, the fact that you have shared goals and a vision and a direction that you definitely wanna go, do you think that is a big contributor to it? Absolutely, absolutely. And it's that's a really hard thing to do. You know, that's a really hard thing to do, especially when you're 
building a connection with someone. You know, you have all of these different steps that we move through and there's a lot of pressure, obviously, to move in these steps in like a set period of time or like in a way that is, you know, respected by your parents or respected by your community. But actually talking about what you both want out of your lives and what you both want out of your money is invaluable. I mean, so many people, when I talk to them about this, they're like, yeah, if I, I just interviewed a lady the other day who said, if I had talked to my first husband about this, we wouldn't have gotten past a first date, but it just, mm. we never talked about it. And then we built a life together and then we realized, oh my God, we are so fundamentally mismatched just in terms of, you know, financial goals that it never, and, and values that this was a red flag from day one. If we had actually stopped to think about it or felt like we could talk about it and we could think about it. Um, I think the goals thing too also allows you to sort of plan for the mini goals leading up to the big goal, you know? So if you're saying like, okay, one day I know for sure we want to get married. It's like, okay, well then you have to actually have a wedding fund, right? Okay. Yeah, we should do that. Okay. Well now we've created a wedding fund. Now we've got to create a way to put money in the wedding fund. Now we've got to create a way to like move money from these other parts of our lives into this wedding fund. And then before you know it, that's like a whole journey you've created for yourself to get to this goal that you wouldn't even have had. You wouldn't even have started doing that and setting up the account and diverting the money if you hadn't said, Hey, I really want to, I really want to get married. And it's important to me that, you know, we have 200 people there in St. Lucia on a resort. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> my friend, my friend Amanda will understand. But I, I think that the goals that you both then articulate, like, travel, like as you guys can tell from my 2018 travel is really important to me. And when we were first moving in together, my girlfriend, I said to my girlfriend, like travel is really important to me, but like right now we're moving in together, you know, we're buying stuff for the apartment. It's not important to me right now. Like we can focus on this other stuff, but she filed that one away. So she already knew them when we were sort of level setting for the next year, you said travel is really important to you. Like, let's go some places this year. You know, like let's let's make that our priority. We don't these other things. Like, they can take a lower a lower space on the ranking right now. Like, we can do this together, and then it keeps everything sort of optional, but also helps you move things around and reorder. It keeps it dynamic, I guess. So, if if you were to uh, imagine that you only had like one shot to help our listeners walk away and be able to understand something that you feel is most important in applying mm. money lessons to, to their marriages or their relationships, um, what would that one thing be? You know, I, I actually want to do like a separate story on this because I do, it comes up every time I talk to people who feel really good about where their relationship is at regarding talking about money and planning for goals and managing money together is that they have, and I don't have this, so I am, I need to take this medicine, but they have a money date. They have a regular money date. And I don't do that, even though I write about this stuff. And I should. Every time someone brings it up, without doubt, someone says, you know, they call it the state of the union meeting, or they call it the finance meeting, or they call it the money date, all these other things. They, they all say, you know, we never would have known about X if it weren't for that, or we never would have noticed this, or we never would have planned for that. And I'm like, oh yeah, I should do that. I should do that. I should do that. That would be good. I feel like maybe me expressing this to your listeners is my way of holding myself accountable to do this right now. Maybe when, if, if I do not have this set up by the time this episode comes out, that'll be my sign that like, oh God, okay, I really need to move this up to the top of my to-do list. I'm with you. We we talk about the importance of regular communication and money dates and uh, you know, home business meetings. They're, they're re referred totally. to in different ways. Totally. But, you know, I'm not great at them. We 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 miss some, and it's in part because it's. I know you're supposed to have like you know you have to have this really great setting where you're not going to be bothered. You're in a exactly. relaxed environment, but it's still maybe it is for you all, but it's not a like a hoot. Like, oh, I can't wait to talk about our personal finances totally. you know, today. Totally. <laughs> totally. You just have to do it. Totally. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. That's why I think, like, I just interviewed somebody, and it'll it'll be in an upcoming piece. Oh, I actually was Megan Ford, Bruce. So thank you again Perfect. for introducing me to her. Um, but she said, ideally, this is something that builds your intimacy. 
And I thought that was so mm-hmm. well said that ideally this is something that you both leave the meeting. Like maybe you have a fight in the middle of the meeting. Maybe one of you says, actually, I don't want to spend money on that in the middle of the meeting. Like maybe something comes up, but by the end of it, you leave feeling closer. And I was, when she said that, and I was writing this story, I thought, that's the part I've got to remember, you know, like yeah. keeping that feeling in mind, that'll incentivize me to do it. That like, okay, we're sitting down, we're looking at the credit card, you know, we're reviewing all these things, but at the end of it, I'm going to walk away and I'm going to feel like, yeah, we did that. We did that. That feels good. We're, we're, we're doing this together. We're a team right now. Like that feeling I can, I can endure some spreadsheet, you know, gripes for that feeling. I can do that. Well, that is the perfect parting wisdom for today's podcast. Um, thank you again for for coming in and and sharing with our listeners um, so much of what you've learned over the years and some of your favorite episodes and in, in, in your journey. Thank you for what you do. Seriously, thank you. A special thanks to our guest, and of course to all of our listeners. Don't forget to click subscribe wherever you download your podcast. Give us a rating and share the Modern Husbands podcast with others. Doing so goes a long way in growing our reach and helps married couples learn how to manage money and the home as a team. And join your fellow Modern Husbands and have links to our podcast articles and other resources to manage money and the home as a team sent to your inbox every couple of weeks by subscribing to our newsletter at modernhusbands.com. Until next time, be well.